I'll get right to a point of uh, how we, this is a change in subject now and how we manage and evaluate uh, renal masses uh, in Dallas at UT Southwestern. Uh, those of you, some of you from Texas may have seen some of my patients, we get these MRIs. So I'm gonna share with you how we use MRI to detect uh, clear cell carcinoma and then direct patient care for all these uh, masses. So background, this is, everybody knows this. We have an increase, of course, in small renal masses uh, based on uh, the utilization of cross-sectional imaging. These, the pathology, of course, we know when we get a, an ultrasound or a CT scan, uh, certainly a single face CT comes to you from the ER, you don't know what to do. And I don't repeat another CT, I'll get these MRIs and skip. Instead of getting a triphasic CT, I'll get a triphasic MRI as I'll share with you. So we also know that many of these masses are, are uh, indolent, right? 20% we know are benign. And so many are candidates for active surveillance. And so we need to figure out which is the appropriate way uh, to, rec to uh, recommend and manage these patients. So the treatment, um, so the guidelines, any, AOA, any of the guidelines really don't distinguish in, in any detail uh, how we should evaluate small renal masses and then recommend treatments uh, distinguishing by histology. The assumption is that, you know, T1As are all treated alike, and we kind of know that that's not the case anymore. And so that's and it's incorrect. There is... Uh, we know that the prognosis of patients with small renal masses depends on their tumor histology, and I think this is a, a nice little chart uh, where uh, size versus time, uh, we know that clear cell papillary type 2 uh, certainly can be a threat to the patient's life and during their life expectancy, but many chromophobes, papillary type 1s, and certainly oncocytomas and AMLs will never uh, be a threat to the patient's life within but when they're diagnosed and the average you know patients diagnosed in in the 60s or older so what we want to do is distinguish identify those those tumors that would be a threat when the small renal mass is identified knowing that many will never die of their of the disease so subtype affects outcomes and so the big push by many of the co my colleagues in the renal cell carcinoma space is that we should biopsy everybody and i don't know how many people here biopsy routinely i do not um, and, um, but there is a big push that every renal mass should be biopsy. We, we biopsy every prostate. Uh, we don't do radical prostatectomy without a tissue diagnosis, right? Historically, biopsies would not be recommended, right, because of the tumor seeding concerns and inaccuracy of the biopsy, but now it is an accepted means of tumor evaluation. Having said that, there are some significant pros and cons to doing a biopsy. One, the pros, uh, yeah, it will reduce the number of benign nephrectomies. Uh, sensitivity and specificity, the positive predictive value is essentially 100%. A biopsy is cancer, it's a 100% chance it's, it's going to be cancer. It's accurate. The problem is the converse of, of that, and there are cons. One, no one likes it. It hurts. There is a 1% chance of hemorrhage that could complicate a partial nephrectomy going forward. I've had it too many times. Uh, some hematuria. Not all tumors, as in this picture, are even amenable. It's a small picture up there in the upper right, but are even amenable to a biopsy. Anterior hyalur tumor, you can't even biopsy, but you can, of course, get an MRI, uh, to my point. Um, <clears throat> there is a small likelihood of upstaging in the literature, quoted at 1% now, that you'll convert a T1A to a T3. Maybe it doesn't matter. We don't know the natural history of that. And there is a risk of tumor seeding. It's not zero. Just 2019, there is a paper in European Urology identifying tumor seeding after needle biopsy of a renal uh, tumor. And the most disconcerting to me, non-diagnostic rate of 14% in the recent meta-analysis and the negative predictive value of 63%, meaning one-third of your biopsies that are negative, not cancer, are actually cancer. One-third of your of your biopsies. So to me, that's an unreliable biopsy. The whole point is to find a negative, is to find a benign tumor, and you can't trust one third of those results. So there's gotta be a better way. And the better way to me is if biopsy is the gold standard, this is the platinum standard in, in, at, at UT Southwestern. And that is to get an MRI. And that replaces the role of uh, renal mass biopsy. Standard MRI, really, we call it multiparametric because that's what they do for prostate. But it's T2 image, a T1 image, and then a T1 with uh, the, uh, contrast enhancement. 
And these are all standard sequences. They're not research sequences. The, the thing that is challenging for your radiologist is to learn this algorithm. And if your radiologist learns this algorithm, it can help you as a clinician. And so <clears throat> I can share these slide sets with everybody. I think they're being s s uh, uh, shared. And, um, and I, you know, I'm going to run through this. I don't, this is not what the urologist does. So I'm going to run through this really quickly. But basically, you want to rule out uh, fat. You get a, uh, uh, you want to assess if it's enhancing on the uh, and, and T1, and then go on through this uh, uh, two, two, uh, T2. You want to see if there's enhancing component in the tumor. I'm sorry, and then you look at, uh, at and I'll blow this up in, in a little bit more uh, uh, blow up and see how we f f uh, run through this. But you can see how every single uh, tumor type would fall into one of these pathways. And so, for example, let's look at this. So here we have a, we're going to have an MRI uh, that we're going to ask is the signal intensity on T2 versus uh, come it's not going forward there versus uh, the uh, normal cortex. This is a hyperintense tumor on, on T2. Then we'll look at T1 uh, enhancement. Is it intense enhancement or moderate enhancement? Now some of this is judgment, and the answer is it's intense. And then we'll go back on and look at the cortical medullary phase and look at to see if there's intravoxel fat. They can determine that even though you can't see the fat. And then, and this will be concluding that this would be a tumor that is a clear cell carcinoma. And so they can run through these algorithms. As you can imagine, here's the other end of the spectrum, a hypo-intense tumor. Um, trying to, uh, on T2 compared to normal parenchyma, we look at the enhancement uh, on T1, and it's mild enhancements compared to the parenchyma. And when, when this comes down, it's a, most likely a papillary carcinoma. It's AML, but if you look at the small language there, it's, it's very rare to be an AML. So we would conclude this is a papillary carcinoma. Conversely, about 10% of clear cells can be uh, hypointense on T2. And if they are hypo-intense on T2, well, I'm sorry, we can calculate something called the arterial delayed enhancement ratio. They'll do this where the, at the cortical medullary phase. And they, you can actually get numbers for enhancement uh, on MRI. And when they do so, and you calculate this arterial, uh, delayed in, arterial to delayed phase enhancement ratio, you can see that you can separate fat poor from clear cell carcinoma very well. And this is all relevant to these rare hypo-intense tumors because they can be intensely enhancing. And so, but this is hypo-intense to start. So is this going to be an AML or clear cell carcinoma? And as you can imagine, we can calculate this ratio. They calculate this ratio. The ratio is going to be greater than 1.5. So this is an AML. And the radiologist can go through this. The only problem is in the middle, which is why I didn't show you that. And this is the, in the middle of this, it could be anything. So then how do I use this in clinical practice? Well, first of all, we have uh, published uh, the accuracy per se and the performance numbers in terms of sensitivity, specificity, et cetera, uh, for all tumor types. And as you can see, the numbers are not perfect, but they are literally as good as biopsy. Uh, so it appears to be a reasonable tool to identify clear cell carcinoma and papillary carcinoma. And so what we did for the surgeons who are not very smart is to develop what we call a clear cell likelihood score. So this is what all, this is all I look, like, look at when I get a report, and I get this in every report. Definitely not clear cell to definitely clear cell, one through five. And that will determine what I do. As you can imagine, the, the conclusion is if it's a one, it's a papillary, I can observe that maybe. And if it's a five, it's going to be clear cell, and I could treat that and recommend treatment for a two centimeter tumor, or three centimeter tumor to that patient because I know it's a clear cell and I never biopsied it. So this whole flow diagram comes down to the bottom row here. You can see, I don't know, oh, you can't see my mouse and I keep on pointing. So the bottom is the CCLS scores are populated uh, and, and, and that's the numbers that I get in my clinical practice. So we've looked at how this performs in T1A tumors looking across number of radiologists and the core, uh, they correlate very well in terms of their uh, performance. The inter variability is, uh, is adequate. 
And then we looked at, this is the first paper ever studied looking at this scoring system. Looking at fours and fives that are going to be clear cell carcinoma, sensitivity almost 80%, specificity 80%, and the positive predictive value and negative predictive value there in the 80s. So not exactly as good as a biopsy for the positive predictive value, but remember, we positive predictive value of biopsy is going to be 100%, but it outperforms the negative predictive value of a biopsy. And then for clear cell, uh, for uh, CCLS 1 and 2s, where are going to be populated by papillaries, the positive predictive value that it is not a clear cell is 93%. Biopsy would be 90, 100%. So almost as good as a biopsy on the other extreme, that you're confident this is a papillary carcinoma and not a clear cell carcinoma. So the most common false positives on the high end, the fours and fives that are clear cell, yeah, there's going to be some oncocytomas in there and some lipid-poor AMLs, so 6%. But the other ones are still cancer, some papillaries and some chromophobes. So altogether, the, in the CCLS four and fives, if you, you say, consider all cancer, when I get a four or a five, I know that 94% of those are actually cancer, of which the majority are going to be clear cell by far but 94% of these are cancer. I don't need to biopsy that patient, right? And so how do we do going forward? So since 2016, this is in every report at UT Southwestern, and uh, we looked at how we perform, not even for T1As, we did this for T T3 tumors, T4 tumors, a CCLS score is provided, and I'll show you that data. So prospectively, the numbers are actually even better. Of course, there's some learning with the radiologists and and you know feedback loops of what the pathology is but sensitivity is even better for cclos4 and 5 now up, in, up almost 90 percent and the positive predictive values are now in the mid 80s and conversely we can definitely tell you when it's not a clear cell carcinoma for one and twos where the performance numbers are uh, uh, in 100 percent in terms of positive predictive value uh, so looking across a couple hospitals now in Dallas area, that is Parkland, uh, which is bigger than UT Southwestern, and then looking at our data, we went ahead and, again, looked at T1A, looked across all, tumor t all tumors and um, sizes, actually, this is, and looked again at the performance, and, it went, and again, it upheld. So ones and twos all the way to the left, the purple is papillary carcinomas with some chromophobes thrown in. Um, and um, the benign being the pink is um, AMLs, so few AMLs, but pretty much, uh, you know, AML and chromophobe. I mean, uh, papillary and chromophobe are going to be one and twos. And then fours and fives are almost all clear cell carcinomas. Again, a few chromophobes slash oncocytomas being the blue thrown in there, uh, such that 94% are cancer. So that really leaves this group as being the indeterminate, the threes, the middle one. Um, so, again, nine, again, going forward, 94% ha remain clear cell, uh, remain malignant in the fours and fives, and only in the one and twos, all the way to the left, only 5% only are, are, are missed as clear cell carcinomas. And another interesting thing is this data, as you might expect, correlates with growth, so the natural history of these tumors when we do active surveillance. So now I can even tell a patient, how, how, are you, how is this tumor going to behave based on your clear cell carcinoma, uh, CCLS score? So the top is volume and the bottom is diameter. But as you can imagine, the one and twos, which are mostly papillary and AML, barely grow over the time of five years. And then the fives being the most likely clear cells, which are probably the most vascular, the more clear, clear cut, are the most rapid growing. So the fours and fives have the greatest change in volume. I'm going to tell you that this is going to grow in the next several years. And I can tell you that a one and two is not going to grow much at all in the next five years. No kidding, because we know they're papillary, we know they're chromophobe, or they're AML. And only the threes, but even the three, which is the most indeterminate, 50-50, could be clear cell carcinoma, barely grow over time. So something about those clear cells are very different than the clear cells that are fours and fives, that they can still be watched. Even if you have a three, I get a three back, I'm saying we're gonna maybe watch this or whatever we're gonna do because I'm not as scared about missing something that's rapidly growing and progressing. Cost, by the way, cheaper than a biopsy. So at UT Southwestern, these are real dollars to do a multi-parametric MRI. Now, the charge is greater, but the cost is only 500 bucks. 
the ultrasound biopsies, 2,000, and a CT guided biopsies over uh, $2,300 in uh, cost to do that. So it's cheaper to do an MRI. And if we look at that, you know, what are the numbers? If we take our uh, 115, our very first paper, 115 patients, and if we did a biopsy and everybody it would have cost us, uh, some of my colleagues around the country, you've seen it, uh, other CME lectures advocating for biopsy, it would be another quarter million dollars in cost for 115 patients. And if I did an MRI and everybody, and then only biopsy to select patients, as I'll show you, it was, we cut those costs by more than 50%. So this is my algorithm and how I practice, as I've already hinted to you. Uh, this is all the performance of uh, MRI in circles, meaning the, the number of patients, the number of cases. And of course, the malignant is orange and the benign is blue. And what, as I, as I you know, made the point, if I get a CCLS 4 or 5, I consider intervention in those patients without biopsy, because I'm confident that 94% of those are going to be malignant. And remember, a biopsy negative predictive value is only 63%. So I'm not going to trust a negative biopsy in a CCLS 4 and 5. It's just too much of an error. Now, the majority, 90% are clear cell, but you're still going to pick up a few of those rare papillary chromophobes. Then the CCLS 1 and 2s. I'm going to encourage, unless they're really young or some other reason, I'm going to encourage active surveillance, particularly if they're under 3 centimeters. I know they barely grow. And I, I know that 96% of them are not going to be clear cell carcinomas. They're going to be um, uh, either papillary or chromophobe in the rare AML. And so uh, I, can, I can recommend surveillance quite confidently for those patients, and they also don't grow very, very quickly. And so that really leaves me the only indeterminate group, which is CCLS3 there, where you can see on the, uh, across the board, about 25 to 30 percent of those circles are benign. So we enriched the benign population to a subset of, of, of patients, and in that 30 percent of CCLS threes are benign. So that might be the only one I do a biopsy on. If it's three and a half centimeters and it's a CCLS three, I'll do a biopsy. Obviously, if it's a one centimeter, two centimeter, I'm going to watch it because I know those growth rates were really slow, and so. I tailor biopsy to only a select patient, and I use MRI as my means of tumor characterization. I do anticipate, honestly, because there's a multi-institutional uh, across the American Society of Radiology now looking at this to be one day, I hope, this will be a PIRADS, right, um, type equivalent that we can get for our renal masses. So anyway, the CCLS as it stands now I think is reliable. I hope I made that point. Uh, it helps in the decision making for our T1 masses, uh, T1A tumors, uh, and should allow us to eliminate biopsy. I don't think that's the gold standard, if that's what we consider. And uh, I made the case that it's cost effective as well if you get an MRI in your patients. So thank you very much.